Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for coming on this somewhat dreary fall evening. I'm Brent Carbajal. I'm the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and pleased to welcome you to another of our uh, lectures, lectures in the, in the uh, uh, Dean's Lecture Series. Um, and this is a, a series of, of talks that uh, our college sponsors and, and uh, we have a, a, a fund for that. I think there was information outside. If you're interested in learning more about that, um, uh, please take that information and I'm sure we'll be able to find you more, more uh, info later. I want to thank uh, the city uh, for their collaboration with us. Uh, as you know, this, this presentation will be filmed and, and will be on TV for, for uh, some time now. And, and so if you want to go back and, and watch things that you missed this evening, you certainly may do so. I want to thank uh, Katrina Schaefer in, uh, in our office for her excellent work in coordinating this and, and Leanne Martin, uh, Associate Dean of the College. Uh, who uh, will help with some of the questions afterwards. Um, also, I wanted to say that when we do do the questions after the presentation, wait for the microphone, because otherwise the people watching on TV won't know what the question is when Ira answers it with great eloquence. So, um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ira Hyman. He is a professor of psychology at Western. Uh, having taken his undergraduate degree at Duke University and his MA and PhD at Emory, um, Professor Hyman has been at Western since 1991, an expert in cognitive developmental psychology. Professor Hyman is an internationally recognized scholar. His work appears in many top-tier academic journals. He's the author of multiple book chapters, and his co-edited book, Memory Observed, Remembering in Natural Contexts, was published in the year 2000. A popular and respected teacher, Professor Hyman has also garnered considerable accolades for his work in the classroom. I think you'll see that here tonight. Uh, in his talk today, he'll discuss inattentional blindness. Many of you have probably read about Professor Hyman's experiment with the unicycling clown, and we've certainly seen the headlines about disastrous events that have resulted from how wed we have become to our, to our smartphones. I suspect that many of us are here, however, because we know just how easy it is to trip over any number of obstacles, texting or emailing en route to a meeting or an appointment. Any of you who have been on the Western campus know that there are bricks that kind of jump out at you if you're not paying attention. And I've oftentimes had colleagues yell out at me and say, Brent, less texting, more walking. And, and that's probably a good, uh, good advice. Uh, an expert on memory and remembering of the past, Professor Hyman will also explain today how and why it is that we're often not even fully registering the present. So you've come this evening to listen to Professor Hyman, so I won't uh, belabor uh, things anymore. So, Professor Hyman. Thanks, and thanks for coming down here this evening. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of the research that we've been playing around with for the last couple of years at Western, uh, about how cell phones make you less aware of the world around you. Um, some of our research has gotten a little bit of notoriety, and when I say our research, it's mostly the students who do the work, and I give them some advice uh, about what we're doing on the data collection, uh, and then they send me out to do these, these presentations. We're really interested in these situations where people, because of the use of technology, become unaware. And so you can find these stories in the news kind of every day. There was a California train wreck a couple of years ago where the engineer failed to notice the stop signal beside the trains beside the tracks, and it turns out that the engineer had uh, sent a text message just before the time and so probably failed to see the stop sign because of texting at the time. There was the famous example of the Northwest pilots who were playing with their computers in the cockpit and flew for a good 70, what is it, 78 minutes without being in touch with the tower and going past the airport they were supposed to go to. And actually, I think that the uh, uh, Air Force sent up fighter jets because they were worried that it was some sort of odd terrorist attack, but no, it was just an uh, attack of a computer. Um, there was, I love this one, one of my favorite ones, a tow truck driver who was picking up a car from an accident actually got into an accident and drove into a swimming pool because he was uh, having a cell phone conversation and maybe even texting at the same time. Um, so that was one of my favorites. And I love these things where people fall down manhole covers uh, and these sorts of things when they're texting a teen and 
uh, New York did this, but there was also the famous example recent, last couple of years of a woman who fell into a water fountain in a mall while she was texting and ended up live on these security cameras there. So there are tons of these examples. And it's also pretty clear that cell phones, when you're driving, may increase the risk of traffic accidents. Uh, there's a nice study by Rettelmeyer and Tipsharani in 1997 where they analyzed the cell phone usage of people who had been in accidents and looked at times when they'd been using their cell phones versus not using their cell phones and concluded that people are four times more likely to be in an accident when they're using their cell phone. A more recent study by researchers at Virginia Tech, they actually put cameras in cars that were aimed toward the driver of the car, toward other people in the car, and then out to the world around them. And they tracked everything the drivers of the cars were doing. So the drivers were aware that they were being watched. And although there were no collisions during this time, they noted that they were twice as likely to be in near collisions when they were talking on the phone, and I love this, 23 times more likely to be in near collisions when they're texting. So there's some of this sort of evidence that it may increase accident rates, or at least the risk of accidents when you're, when you're driving. Um, and it's such a popular thing that it shows up in you know, cartoons pretty regularly. You can find them anywhere you want to go look on the web. Uh, various versions of uh, cell phones and driving and accidents, and they're all, you know, pretty funny for somebody like me. And whenever there's a new one, all of my former students send me links to it via email, and every new story of somebody falling because of a text message or a cell phone, I get, you know, in my inbox or my Facebook page for my former students, so it always makes me happy. Now the question is, why do cell phone conversations distract? Um, one possible answer, and the answer that my students and I have been interested in, that this is an example of attention problems and attention failures. Part of it is an example and an involvement in selective attention, that we really are, as human beings, very good at getting focused on something. And it's part of what makes us very effective in the world is our ability to be focused. But we're also very good at divided attention tasks. It is possible to multitask. You can do two things or three things at once. There's always a risk. And the risk is that whenever you're doing multiple things at the same time, your performance on any of those tasks drops off. But we know that people are able to both do divided attention tasks and actually selectively attend as well. But both of these things can lead to what cognitive psychologists call inattentional blindness, where you get focused. Well, actually, we should start with an example before we even fully define inattentional blindness. And it's a game that all of you can play. Uh, so that we're going to do this as an example here today, um, where we'll, we'll just have you try it out for a second, just to practice your selective attention skills and show you just how good you are with selective attention skills. So I'm going to start with a lovely YouTube video. Um, and I want you to actually follow the instructions. You're going to be asked to count basketball passes. And I want you to count them as best you can. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. Get it? But did you see the moonwalking bear? No! Oh, there's a bear. <laughs> I've always liked this because it's also about uh, bicycle safety. Um, and since I'm a regular bicycle commuter, it always makes me happy to see that example. Um, and it's a really nice example of inattentional blindness. And it's actually based upon one of the originals. And one of my friends on the Parks and Rec board showed it to me years ago, which made me laugh because it's based on original work by my dissertation advisor back in the 1970s. But it gives us an example of inattentional blindness. Because in this situation, you're in a divided attention task in a very complex environment. And in the video game you were just playing along with, you're trying to watch one basketball while there's a lot of other things moving. And so there's a lot of things you can attend to in that environment. And as you get focused on one aspect of it, that's the selective attention. That you get narrowly focused in on one thing. And it's just that one basketball, and you are not attending to everything else in the very complex environment. And when you're in that situation, you can fail to notice something that moves directly through the center of your focus. 
So that moonwalking bear went right across the screen, right in front of you, and most people fail to see the, the moonwalking bear if they're actually doing the task of counting basketball passes and they're not familiar with this. So we've got divided, multiple sets of basketball players. We've got focused on one set of passes. And then you end up with inattentional blindness where you don't see the moonwalking bear or a variety of other things, as it turns out. Now, with cell phones and driving and inattentional blindness, it's another possibility where we could see it. Because the divided attention situation here is that you're both driving and using your cell phone. And for the record, let me be clear, driving itself is a divided attention task. Because when you're driving and doing it appropriately, you're monitoring the road in front of you, you're looking at your instruments, you're looking in your rear view mirrors to make sure that there aren't people around you, or you're watching for the pedestrians around you. It's a lot of things to pay attention to. We also make the situation more complex, usually by having other people in the car, by turning on the radio. If you add a cell phone into the mix, it's one more thing where there's a divided attention. If you get selectively focused on your cell phone, then there's a distinct possibility that you may end up with a failure to notice things that move directly through your focus of attention in that situation. And so that's part of what my students and I have been interested in, is this potential phenomena of inattentional blindness while you're driving and using your cell phone. Some of the best studies on driving and cell phones are actually driving simulator studies by David Strayer and his colleagues at the University of Utah. And they use a driving simulator like this. So they have one of these set up in their laboratory. And, and Britt, we could really use one of these in the basement of the uh, psychology department. Just, you know, if you find a few million dollars laying around someplace. Um, you get one of these lovely driving simulators that has wraparound screens. It's computer programmable uh, so that you can have people move through a relatively realistic looking environment. And I like this picture of the setup best because it's actually David Strayer in his driving simulator with his cell phone out, um, which is a really nice picture of him. And in these simulator studies that Strayer and others have done, what they find is that if you're talking on a cell phone, your ability to drive is substantially worse than listening to a radio, substantially worse than listening to a book on tape. It's also worse than having a passenger next to you. And so in these studies, what they do is they put the experimenter next to you, and they have the exact same conversation you would have if you were talking on the cell phone. And people are worse when they're talking on a cell phone than talking to a person next to them. Um, and in one of their more funny studies, they found that cell phone is use is actually worse than driving while intoxicated at the legal limit of 0.08. That people made more errors and were more likely to cause crashes when they were using a cell phone than when they were driving while intoxicated. Now the question for me is, we know driving with a cell phone makes it worse, that's what Stray and his colleagues have found in these simulator studies, but is it inattentional blindness? There's another study that they did which hints at inattentional blindness. They had signs along the road as people were driving in the simulator, and they checked for people's memory for the signs after they got done with the driving experience, not having told them that they were going to ask them this. They also had, and this is a really cool device as well, an eye tracker hooked up on the people. It's a lovely device you put on somebody's head, and then it has a little laser that points at their eye, and you can actually tell where people are looking with an eye tracker. And they found that the people with the cell phones or without the cell phones were just as likely to look at the signs beside the road. So the eyes were still moving. The eyes were still glancing around the environment. But when you check their memory afterwards, the cell phone users were only half as likely to recall the signs that had been beside the road. They were not able to identify which signs they had seen, and they had seen them because they had looked at them, and which ones they hadn't seen. So cell phone use made people substantially less aware of their environment. Now there's a thing that my students and I, when we were reading this work, were concerned with, and that is that driving in a simulator is kind of an odd experience. <laughs> it's not like driving in your real car, because it's this weird simulator, it's not your car, and you get used to driving in your car, which makes it easier. Driving in somebody else's car is always a difficult task. It's not your usual route, you're not familiar with the streets. And driving on your usual routes may be easier than driving in these simulators with odd places to go. And it's also not your typical phone conversation. <laughs> your typical cell phone conversation you're having with someone you know. It's about a topic you're concerned about. In these driver simulator studies, what they do is they have you have a conversation with the experimenter, you choose from a list of possible conversations, which are somewhat political, somewhat interesting, Eh, maybe. And it's an awkward, stilted conversation, usually, as opposed to the conversation you might be having with your friend. So we were kind of wondering if people might be fine if they were in their own car, on a familiar route, having a conversation with somebody they know well. Maybe it would be less of a drain on their cognitive resources. Now, 
you wouldn't want to actually do this in a real world test where people are driving, because if talking on the cell phone makes them worse, there would be some serious liability issues of sending them out to do that um, if they cause an accident. So what we've done instead is pay attention to people walking around on campus. And luckily, from my perspective as a researcher, people walk around on campus using their cell phone constantly. All the students do it, as well as all the deans. Um, so that you can just kind of count on it being the case that you can find people using their cell phones while they're walking around on campus. Our first study that we did was just to observe people walking uh, as they crossed Red Square. So for several days, we monitored people crossing Red Square, and we ended up with 317 people who came across the entire diagonal of Red Square. So that they started over near the library and ex exited between Miller Hall, going down to the south end of campus, went past the fountain between there and the sky viewing sculpture, for those of you who know the campus. We ended up with uh, about even distribution because we were cycling through the different groups as we were making our observations. So that we had a bunch of cell phone users, single individuals or people just walking by themselves with no electronics in, in use. Then we had 54 people who were listening to their music players and 52 people who were walking in pairs that we monitored as they came across. All of the cell phone users, this is data is from, was collected in 2009, all of them were actually talking on their cell phone then. These days on campus, if you monitor people walking using their cell phones, they're texting primarily. Uh, and I'll show you some data on texters in a few minutes. What we measured was a set of things as people came across Red Square. So we looked at how long it took them to come across. We looked at whether or not they changed directions as far as we could see. I had the students, as the people came into Red Square, try and guess what exit from Red Square they were going to use. Were they going to go into one of the buildings? Which door of the building? Were they going to go all the way across? And some people, when they cross Red Square, change their mind, apparently, as they're going across. And they look like they're going one place and they go someplace else. We classified them based on whether or not they were weaving their way across Red Square, the sort of drunken walk whether or not they ever were in a collision or a close collision. Luckily, there were no collisions on Red Square while we were monitoring, but there were several close accidents. Whether or not they tripped over those bricks on Red Square, which didn't happen, actually. That must just be a Dean problem. Um, and then also whether or not they acknowledged other people. Many people, when they cross Red Square walking on campus, see somebody they know, and they nod their head or they wave, show some evidence that they saw somebody that they know as they came across. So I'm going to show you a bunch of graphs set up like this where across the bottom we're going to keep track of walking conditions. So on the left, I'm always going to put our cell phone users. And then the measure we're going to talk about is going to be on the y-axis of our graph. So here what we have is a presentation of how long it took them to cross Red Square. What you should notice here is that the cell phone users and the people walking in pairs are actually slower than the single walkers or people listening to their music uh, as they're coming across Red Square. Substantially slower, actually, if you're looking at a difference between 75 and 85 seconds, it's enough slower that it's meaningful and you can tell when you're behind a cell phone users. Now, the pairs are also slower, so maybe it's just having a conversation makes you worse. Might be a possibility. Could also be that pairs have a more difficult time navigating through a complex environment. If you look at some of the other measures, the cell phone users really start to stand out. So if you look at whether or not they change directions, the cell phone users apparently changed directions, about 30% of them as they were coming across Red Square. Most other people don't show signs that they've changed directions as they're coming across Red Square. If you look at whether or not they're weaving as they come across, the cell phone users are the ones most likely doing the weaving as they come across Red Square, which combined makes them really hard to get around. If you're walking behind one of them, they're slow, they're changing the directions, they're weaving, they're very difficult to get around. You might have seen those people driving down the road too driving slowly, weaving as they go down the road, which is why one of my favorite bumper stickers I've ever seen is, are you drunk or using your cell phone? <laughs> I like that one. Um, and then whether or not they show signs that they saw anybody else they knew, most people, you know, it's not it's something that happens every day, but you see reliably people walking by themselves with music players, even pairs acknowledge other people around them. Cell phone users just don't do this. They don't show any sign that they are acknowledging or seeing anybody that they know. Maybe they just only know people electronically, but they don't show any signs. Were they in any near collisions? Most people aren't in near collisions. This is a relatively rare thing, but the cell phone users are more likely to have come close to walking into somebody. It's actually a fun game to play on campus, is to just keep walking straight towards somebody who's on their cell phone and see when they'll notice you. Um, I don't recommend it because you might get hurt, but it's, it's still an amusing game to play. 
So when we just looked at walking on campus, I want to remind you that walking is an incredibly easy task. You've been doing this since you were a year old. And if there's anything that's easier than navigating your way through an environment you know well while walking, I'd like to know what it is. Because this is about as easy as it gets in terms of tasks. But even in this very familiar environment, in a conversation of your choosing with somebody you probably know well, cell phone users walk more slowly. They change directions and weave. They fail to acknowledge others. They don't seem to be aware of people around them. And they come closer to being in collisions. So this is just our first observational study. But the question is, is this inattentional blindness? Is it that they're unaware of things, and so that's why they're doing all these things poorly when they're walking? That leads us to the unicycling clown study. Because in order to do an inattentional blind uh, study, what you need is an unusual object that you can put in the environment and see if people notice it or not. That's the point with that counting the basketball, is that you have some other object go through the environment and you, you see if people notice it. So in that one, it's a moonwalking bear. In other ones, it's other sorts of uh, objects that people put in there. What we needed was an object to have out on Red Square to see if people would notice. And so the students who had helped collect the first set of data, we were sitting around talking about this. And we were like, well, what do we use? And it turned out one of the students in the group rode a unicycle to campus sometimes. And so I said to him, I said, well, Dustin, maybe you could just ride your unicycle around for a while out there. And, and Dustin said to me, I own a clown suit. And so at that point, it was pretty clear what we would use as our unusual stimulus. I mean, when the universe hands you a unicycling clown, you have to take advantage of it. Um, and so Dustin became our unicycling clown. He spent an hour. I, I like his clown suit, too. It's purple and polka dots, and he's got the big floppy shoes and a big red nose. Um, and he can ride his unicycle for a long period of time without falling while in his clown suit. So what we did, oh, I should also note, clowns are a real hazard, because you never know when one of those is carrying a cream pie. And so you need to be alert and aware if there's a clown around you uh, in a, on a unicycle to catch up to you. So our unicycling clown study, we had the clown circle that sky viewing sculpture on Red Square. It's not on the main walking path, it's just off to the side of the main walking path. He circled that for an hour. He actually went one direction for a half an hour and then turned around and went the other way, so you know, he unwound himself, he said. Um, and I had my students at the opposite corners of the main pathway try to interview everybody who crossed Red Square, and they just had two really simple questions. Did you see anything unusual today as you came across Red Square? A generic question. Let them volunteer it on their own. And if they didn't on their own say, well, there was that unicycling clown, is that what you mean? Then we said, did you see the unicycling clown? We ended up during the one hour when we were doing this, uh, just those quick two-question interviews with 151 inter individuals, most of them just single individuals walking by themselves, but we had 24 cell phone users, 28 people listening to their music players, and 21 individuals in pairs. If they were in pairs, we asked the one closest to us uh, when they came across, so we didn't interview both of them in pairs. And if one saw it, then they both saw it. In response to the general question, did you see anything unusual, this is the percentage of individuals who's on their own volunteered the clown. Notice that the single individuals and the music players, they're at about 30% of them on their own volunteer, that unicycling clown. The pairs of people are above 50%. In this sense, two sets of eyes are substantially better than one. The cell phone users are unlikely to volunteer it on their own. Under 10% of them on their own say, oh, the clown? When we ask them directly, this is a combination of both questions now, were they aware of the unicycling clown? The people walking alone or with their music player, over half of them noticed the clown. The pairs, it's over 70% of them notice the clown, but it's only 25% of people using their cell phones became aware of that unicycling clown as they were crossing Red Square. So what we've got here, clear evidence of inattentional blindness. Cell phone users, because it's this complex environment, it's a divided attention task, they're both trying to walk and have the cell phone conversation. They get tied up in the cell phone conversation and less aware of the world around them. They miss things, particularly our unicycling clown. Now the interesting thing is everyone who missed the unicycling clown has the exact same response when you ask them, did you see the clown? They turn around and look, they look back surprised, and they'll oftentimes laugh. <laughs> An embarrassed laugh that they're surprised that they could have missed something like this. 
And this actually is sort of the classic finding in inattentional blindness studies, is that when you ask people afterwards, did you see this, the response is not no, because it's an unusual stimulus. You're like, no? And they're surprised that they could have missed it. And what this shows is how unaware we are of our unawareness, that we are blithely unaware. We just don't know what's going on around us, which is why we can't actually trust drivers who think they're fine. They say, I'm talking on my phone, I'm perfectly aware of what's going on around me. It's like, no, what you have is what uh, Dan Simons has called an illusion of awareness, where you know what you know and you think that's all there is to know. You're unaware of everything you're unaware of. That's the whole definition of unaware anyway. And that's a real problem because those things that you don't notice could be the thing that suddenly is in front of your car. It could be the light that's changed. It could be the car that's breaking in front of you that you've not become aware of because of this. So the unicycling clown is a, is a pretty compelling example of inintentional blindness and of even in this most simple navigation task of walking your way around of an environment, of failing to become aware of something that is potentially important, the clown carrying a cream pie. So what do we know so far? Cell phone users walk more poorly. They miss the clown. They suffer from inintentional blindness but think they're just fine. So cell phone drivers are probably the same way. They're going to drive more poorly. They're going to be less aware of the world around them. They're going to suffer from inattentional blindness, but they think they're fine. So it's always one of the tricky things about convincing people to stop using their phone while they're driving. What we're interested in more recently, though, is will they fail to become aware of something that's directly in front of them? The self, the, in, the, in our unicycling clown, he's a little off to the side. And in classic sorts of studies of intentional blindness, you have that moonwalking bear go right through the middle of the visual system. What we want to play around with is putting something directly in front of people and preferably have it be something to which they respond by moving to avoid it and see if they still don't become aware of it. These are instances of what we're calling, my students and I are calling mindless wandering, where you're kind of wandering through the world completely unaware of what you're doing as you're going through the world. Um, and really, I think this happens to many of us fairly frequently. You've probably been a victim of this sort of mindless wandering where you've driven home and not remembered the trip. You find yourself suddenly at home and you're like, oh, here I am. For me, it happens sometimes when I actually meant to stop for something on the way and I find myself pulling in the driveway realizing I did not stop at the grocery store and I had intended to stop at the grocery store and wondering where my mind was when I was driving home. I'm assuming many of you have had this experience, and luckily I've not hit anything yet, but you know, I, I worry, you know, how unaware are we as we're, we're going through the environment? It seems to me that people can walk and drive without awareness of everything around them, and they can even respond sometimes without becoming aware of what's around them. So I must have avoided cars, I must have stopped at stoplights, but I seem to not be aware by the time I got home, which would be kind of an interesting example of inattentional blindness because it would be a difference between using some of that visual information to still guide my behavior, but not having it come into awareness. And this is the phenomena we're trying to explore now. Our first instance of doing this is just using a signboard on campus. Signboards are fairly common on campus. They put them up to announce events. Uh, the bookstore puts them up to announce sales, so do all the coffee shops on campus. Um, and so we just put a signboard out uh, on campus, but we actually put ours in the pathway right in the pathway so the people would have to move to avoid it so that they wouldn't fall into our signboard. Our signboard just said a very simple message, psychology research in progress, because I like to be as honest as possible when I'm conducting research. We watched, again, cycling through people in different conditions, a set of cell phone users, single individuals, and people using their music players. Um, all of these cell phone users were talking on their phone. In a few moments, I'll go to a study where we actually pay attention to textures as well because my students were getting annoyed because there was more textures than cell phone talkers, and they said we got to use textures as well. Um, and our question is really quite simple. First, when do people move to avoid the sign? The good news is nobody hit the sign and ran into it. Uh, so everybody avoids the sign, but the question for us is when do they move to avoid it? Do they start early and just move around it, or do they wait until the last second? a few feet away from the sign. And then we ask them as they get past the sign, did you have to avoid anything as you were walking along the path? A simple question. And then if they acknowledge that they did, we ask them what it was. Do they know what they avoided? Do they know the content of that signboard? So that they may or may not know they avoided something even though they did so. So first of all, we look at when they move. 
cell phone users are the ones more likely to wait until the last moment. They are 25% of them within five feet of the signboard before they actually move and go around the signboard. And oftentimes they could surprise and look up and move around it. Most other people move well in advance of that and move smoothly to avoid the signboard. But cell phone users are kind of caught off by that. Um, when we ask them, well, first of all, we have to ask them if we can ask them a few questions. Cell phone users are the least likely to agree to answer any other questions. I'm on my phone. Hello. <laughs> so, and I, I worry here that we've lost some of the least aware cell phone users because they don't want to talk to us at all. Most people are happy to, you know, answer two questions. Did you see the signboard? Were you aware you went around the signboard? Um, most people have an idea that they did it, but cell phone users are the least likely to know they went around the signboard. Um, even though they wait till the last moment, they aren't aware that that's what they've done, uh, that they went around the signboard by the time they're 10 feet past it. <laughs> Do you know what was on the signboard that had this lovely little message that said, psychology research in progress? Uh, not too many people read the signboards on campus, but the cell phone users are the least likely to be aware that there was a signboard, that they moved to avoid it, or what the signboard actually said. So again, evidence of inattentional blindness. Now we come to what I and my students think is our uh, most fun study, and that's where we're going to grow a money tree on campus. Um, I bet you didn't know you had one of those, did you? Uh, so we've got a money tree on campus these days. Not today, so don't go looking. Um, it only grows some days. But what we did is on some of the narrow paths that go from the main academic portion up to a set of the dorms, we found a branch that hung out over the path, and if there wasn't one available, we bent a branch so it hung out over the path, and we would hang some money on the branch. Um, we ended up finally paying $3 at a time on the branch, right at face height for your average pedestrian, so that they have to avoid it if they don't want to get smacked in the face. Um, as they're walking along the pathway. So we know that they generally avoid it, although a couple of people do get hit in the face. Um, a little bit riskier here. And I must admit that uh, I was a little anxious when we were doing this because I, I ponied up the dollar bills to do this. Um, and so we ended up getting observations of, well, you know, a little over 400 people, or right around 400 people. We've got 63 cell phone users, about half of them talking, half of them texting. 268 people just walking along on their own, no electronics of any sort, and then a bunch of music players as well uh, walking along uh, out there. And it's really, we don't even interview these people. <laughs> we just watch them walk. So I've got two students at a time out there with the money hanging on the tree, several feet away, just watching people as they come by, not to whether or not they glance, because that doesn't tell you whether or not they noticed it. You want to watch for some behavioral sign that they really realize it's money that there's money hanging on that tree. And so we wanted them to look at it, clearly show that they were looking at it, or take it. And they were free to take it. We put a little note on it that said, thanks for participating in our attention research, but they were welcome to take my money. Um, and that's what made me nervous, is that I was worried I was going to lose a lot of dollar bills. Um, and so we're going to take a look at how many people took my money, um, in essence. Uh, and we'll take a look at it. And this is what it essentially looks like. Um, that's uh, Jesse Ware, one of my students who's helped collect some of the data, uh, blithely texting as he walks along past our money tree. We don't use pictures of people who are the real subjects because we'd have to get their informed consent to do so. So you can see that the money is hanging there. He's nicely avoided getting hit in the face by the money, um, and it's right at head height for Jesse, and Jesse is a little shorter than me, so it's right at head height for almost all the students on campus. He's texting, of course, because um, he likes to show off whenever possible. So here's the percentage of people who actually take or examine my money in some fashion. And I just want to note, for almost everybody, the percentage is low. People aren't aware of the money hanging on the tree in their face. Uh, so that we're looking in general for people who are single people walking alone with no electronics, it's around 20%. For people using their music player, it's a little over 20%. For cell phone users, both texters and talkers, it's just hovering at 5% of them become aware of the money. Now, I know that when you were young, your parents probably said the line to you, money doesn't grow on a tree. You know, I know my parents did. The good news is, or the bad news is, depending on how you look at it, that even if it did, you wouldn't be aware of it. 
and particularly not if you were using your cell phone. You wouldn't notice the money hanging on a tree. So our mindless wandering is really quite nice because cell phones seem to increase this sort of mindless wandering where you're unaware of the environment around you. You walk more poorly. You fail to notice the clown. People are unaware that they avoided a signboard, even though they did so, and they fail to respond to money hanging on a tree in front of them. So these cell phone distractions, when people are using them, cell phones are probably the most serious distraction that's available if you're driving or walking. It's worse than having a person next to you. If anything, having two people watching the road is safer because you've got two sets of eyes. A person next to you in the car modulates the course of the conversation when something on the road changes. The cell phone conversation doesn't do that. Um, it's worse than any other electronic media. Listening to a book on tape, listening to the radio is perfectly fine. But having a cell phone conversation is much more distracting. It's potentially the worst distraction that you can use while you're driving down the road. Still, why is the question. What's so bad about a cell phone? How is it worse than having a person in the car? Some of my colleagues who are other cognitive psychologists have suggested that having that cell phone conversation as opposed to having the person next to you, you start to imagine that other person and imagine where they are and seeing them in your head. And so it, it takes up your cognitive visual capability so that you're less able to see the stuff around you. It's a distinct possibility, but it's not one that I personally think is the right answer. And I don't know the right answer yet, but I suspect it's because cell phones make the conversation much more difficult than having a conversation with somebody next to you. You lose automatically all the nonverbal information when you're on a phone conversation of any sort. And so you have less of that sort of body language, less facial expression to help guide the conversation. But worse than that, cell phone companies don't like to devote much bandwidth to your telephone conversation. They want to save all their bandwidth to your downloads to your smartphone. So they don't devote much bandwidth. And what that means is they give you a very poor vocal quality. They really restrict the range of the vocal information. So it's a less, it's a tinnier sound than even a landline phone. It's a less good sound. This makes it harder to understand what people are saying. You have to put more effort in to understand what people are saying. They also do one other thing that you may not be aware of. They are willing to delay when they send the signal, the conversational utterance that somebody just made. They'll delay it up to a half a second in order to balance out the bandwidth usage of their network. This is the reason why when you're in a cell phone conversation, something happens that almost never happens on a landline conversation or other places. You both start talking at once. This happens in cell phone conversations because there was a lag and you thought it was your conversational turn, so you start and then they start and then you both go, I'm sorry, you go ahead. And this is because of the lack of information and the delay of information with cell phones. And all of this means that tracking the flow and the give and take in a cell phone conversation is substantially more difficult than almost any other conversation that you have. And this would imply that if actually cell phone companies devote a little more bandwidth, it might not be so bad. I don't know on that one, but I do know that with the quality of cell phone conversations we have, it makes people substantially less able to, to track those sorts of things. So in terms of these sort of cell phones and wandering around campus and driving in a car, this mind-wandering awareness, you can wander along without awareness in the environment, and you generally aren't going to trip over things. And you could probably drive relatively safely as long as there's no one else on the road. And avoid objects that aren't moving. Awareness, becoming aware of an object, requires focused attention. You have to actually pay attention to the object in order to have every feature of it hang together and to create an object for it. It's called binding for cognitive psychologists. And sometimes an unusual feature of the environment, a new loud noise, a new bright sound, something moving will grab your attention and you'll look over there. But sometimes it fails to grab your attention. And without getting your attention focused, you may or may not be aware of what that object is that's over there. Divided attention increases your odds of a lack of awareness, a sort of mindlessness where you're wandering along without knowing what is happening around you. And since you need attention to bind those features into objects, when you don't have as much attention capacity left over, it means there's going to be a lot of objects that you're completely unaware of uh, going around you in the environment. So my advice has been and continues to be, and I give this lecture to my students at Western, and I've actually gone down to Olympia and talked to the uh, legislative officers and was there a year and a half ago when they were changing the laws to make texting illegal and handheld illegal. 
hands-free should also be illegal from my perspective because it's not hands or hands-free, it's what your head is doing that matters. Um, that we should hang up and drive because cell phones are a serious distraction. They're at least as bad as drunk driving. They cause an intentional blindness so you're not aware of the world around you. And the key thing here is that your intuition isn't reliable. You are unaware that you're missing things. You think you're doing fine, but you're unaware of all the things you're not seeing until it's too late. And so there, if you're not aware of what the object is, you don't know how you need to respond to it, and that's kind of an important point here. One of the questions I sometimes get asked and that my students ask me is, can people get better at these sort of divided attention tasks? Can people learn to use a cell phone while they're driving? Here's the complicated answer, yes and no. Clearly, people get better at divided attention tasks. You can get better because you learn to drive a car. And when you were first driving a car, it was way too many things to track at once. And as you become better at driving a car, you can monitor the road, the cars around you, even in difficult traffic situations, still have a conversation with somebody else. Clearly, we get better at divided attention tasks. And so that's the yes side. On the no side, that's the skills of divided attention. On the no side, you always need to attend to an object to know what the object is, to bring it into awareness and to have an idea of what it is. And actually, let's, let me just real quickly have you try another example, because uh, it's, it's another one of these sort of fun examples that you can try. Um, and again, it's going to be counting basketball passes, I'll warn you now, and I want you to do the task again. I know you've done this task once, but trust me, try it again. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Get it? Did you spot the gorilla? Yes. For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? <laughs> Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. <laughs> and that's the monkey business illusion. And all of this highlights this business about the problem with these divided attention tasks. Is yes, you can get better at many divided attention tasks. But in order to become aware of a new object in the environment, you have to devote attention to it. And so if you've got your attention divided and it becomes focused on one thing, you might see sort of the expected things. You might still be able to stay on the road. But it's going to be the novel stimulus that throws you off. It's going to be the unexpected pedestrian. It's going to be the light changing. It's going to be what you're not looking for that's going to throw you off and make you less safe of a driver. Um, and that's going to cause the accidents. And you never get better at that part because you always have to have attention resources devoted in order to be looking for those sorts of things. Um, and that's what you lose. I want to make my, my thanks and acknowledgments here because I don't actually do the real work of going out and interviewing people and counting all the behaviors. That's all my students. And so on the Unicycling Clown paper that was published in 2010, the co-authors were all Western students, Matt Boss, Brianne Wise, Kira McKenzie, and Jenna Caggiano. Um, the Unicycling Clown was another student, Dustin Randall. If you've seen videos of the Unicycling Clown, that's Joe Morris, who's a uh, staff member on campus and who's been hooked into doing some unicycling in a clown suit over the last few years for various TV productions. There were several other students who helped collect the data but didn't want to continue working on the paper. And then our more recent stuff on signboards and uh, money on a tree has involved a, a set of more recent students who have been working with me over the last uh, two years. 
Um, I also really want to give thanks to the city of Bellingham for hosting these uh, talks down here and my appreciation to my employer, Western Washington University. I have been there for a long time and they've treated me very well and I'm very appreciative of the university and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and the psychology department. Thank you and I'll happily take any questions. So I'm thinking about uh, your question of why is it that uh, a cell phone conversation on the phone might be more distracting than a conversation with another person? Mm -hmm. And I wondered if, uh, thinking back to your explanation for why people in pairs walking across Red Square were more likely to see the clown than even individuals, that it's, you've got two sets of eyes, more likely to catch it, and I, I certainly know at times uh, driving with other people, that they will notice things and say, oh, hey, look, you know, watch out. So could it be that that's part of the reason why another person in the car is actually another set of eyes and, and also can respond if something unusual happens, the conversation stops, we need to pay attention out here? Yeah, I think um, that's why the pairs are better than single individuals, is that you've got two sets of eyes, and if either of them notices the unicycling clown, they go, hey, look at the idiot. Um, and so they, they point it out, right? It's also why having a person with you in the car can be advantageous as long as you're not distracting each other um, because, you know, you've got two sets of eyes again watching. But the question isn't just why are two better than one, it's why does that cell phone conversation make you worse than if you were doing any other distraction? The, the cell phone conversation, I mean, you're listening to the radio, that doesn't distract you. You're listening to a book on tape, you know, and it doesn't distract you. Um, and even, they've done some cell phone conversations which are really quite simple, where all you actually have to do is repeat what the person on the other end of the line says. This doesn't distract you. It's only when it's a real conversation that it distracts you. When you have to actually pay attention to what they're saying, plan your next utterance, say what you're saying, listen again, plan what you're gonna say, it's when you get engaged in the full give and take of a conversation on a cell phone that it disrupts performance in those driving simulators. Um, texting is, you know, slightly different because it's not quite the same rate of give and take, but there's enough attention focused down here that you become less aware of the world around you. Now, many texters, when they walk, are glancing up and down, and I know from some of my students that they say they can text in their pocket um, you know, in class or while they're driving, they don't have to look. But it's not where your hand is, it's where your head is. And so if your head is full of thinking about LOL, um, then you're less aware of the world. And so it's, it's, it's kind of complex. A passenger in the car may help compared to driving alone, but a cell phone conversation makes you worse than driving alone. And so it's the, it's the decrement, which is really quite interesting to me, uh, that it makes you so much less aware. Um, I don't, obviously, I don't drive with a cell phone. Otherwise, you know, it would be really embarrassing for me um, if something went wrong. And I've trained everybody in my family not to as well, although my mother, not my kids, was the hardest one to train. I noticed on um, a lot of the graphs that the people that were listening to their iPod, listening to music, they had a little bit higher awareness than the single people, and I was wondering what you might attribute that to. It's an interesting question. I, in, when, we, when we look at numbers like this, we play all sorts of statistics games to, to make a decision on whether or not we think those numbers are meaningfully different. And I'm, I'm not confident that people using their iPod, listening to music, are more aware of the world than people just walking without electronics. Uh, there's a distinct possibility, right? I, I don't dismiss that, but it, it's an interesting pattern. If it's the case, there are a couple of possibilities that focusing on the music gives you something to focus on, and so you're less likely to do uh, kind of daydreaming while you're walking. And a lot of us, when we walk, start thinking about all sorts of other things, and so maybe you're doing less of that, and so you're more aware uh, when you've got music because it tends to focus your attention on something that doesn't take much attention but keeps you from thinking other thoughts. Um, that would be my best guess, if there's a meaningful difference there, and I'm not sure there's a meaningful difference there uh, in terms of that. Um, I do know 
that if you're driving and you're tired, that turning on the radio is a good idea. Uh, because in that situation, what the radio does is it increases your arousal level uh, and makes, it makes you more likely to be aware of the world. But I don't think that's a problem with our students, uh, and that's why they're better. I think it's, it's more that they're daydreaming or thinking about too many other things when they don't have the music on. So I don't usually ask questions at these, but I, but I have one. Um, in your first experiment, you asked a number of cell phone users if they had seen anything unusual. And then he said, no. Then you asked those very same people if they had seen the unicycling clown, and they would say yes. Do you attribute that to their assuming that, or, or <laughs> thinking that clowns on a unicycle are not unusual, or are they embarrassed and they're, and they're just lying to you? <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty, yeah, it's, I, we always laughed about that too. It's like, so you didn't think that clown was any? Yeah, no, because they, they do say it then. I actually think that what it is in, in that situation is by the time they've come across there, they may have seen the clown and not thought much of it. Um, and so when you say, do you see anything unusual, they just don't remember it right at that moment. Uh, it fails to, to come into awareness. When, but when you say, what about the clown? They go, oh, yeah, the clown. Um, so I don't actually think they're lying because the ones who really didn't see the clown display a substantially different behavior. The shocked, surprised, how could I have missed the clown? Um, and it's, it's so reliable, these inattentional blindness. That's, that's the, for me, that's really the, the biggest take-home message is you, this illusion that you know what's around you that you're aware of the world around you. I mean, this is some, some of your point in your question a moment ago of noticing the world behind me or around you and those things like that. We have this illusion at any given moment that we are aware of everything around us, and it's an illusion. Um, and when you have it pointed out to you, it's kind of shocking, particularly in these sorts of examples, that you could have missed something that seems so obvious on the face of it once you become aware of it. Um, and that's the thing that's most disturbing to me about uh, People think they're doing fine when they're driving, using their cell phone, but it's only because they're, they're not aware of what they're missing. Just now that you said that, uh, has this been looked at as far as witnesses for crimes, things like that? I mean, it seems like that could have profound implications on if you're not aware of what you're seeing or haven't seen. Yeah, I mean, um, in my other set of research I play around with uh, eyewitness memory stuff from time to time and you know this is important for those sorts of things as well. Um, I've actually been called on a couple of court cases that have to do with accidents while people are walking and texting or walking and talking. I haven't been in any courtrooms on those yet but I've actually you know talked to a couple of uh, people who are being sued you know and there are funny examples along these lines as well. So yeah there, there are legal implications as well. Uh, and they're kind of interesting, but I'm much more interested in the prevention side of uh, trying to, to stop the worst uh, situations. And, you know, for walkers, the person you're most likely to damage is yourself. So, you know, have at it. Um, for drivers, <laughs> you know, drivers is a different game entirely. Because they're the person you're putting at risk is not just yourself, it's the world around you you're putting at risk. And I just think that, you know, for me, there's a, a real important message about prevention here. I shouldn't have probably said have at it for the walkers. You know, we, we should really be trying to stop that as well. But still, um, I'm, I'm going for prevention. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Professor Hyman. And, and uh, we we'll hope to see you all at a, a, a talk next, next quarter as well. Good night.